Imperium, The Philosophy of History and Politics, Chapter 5, The Demise of the Linear View of History. Life is a continuous battle between young and old, old and new, innovation and tradition. Ask Galileo, Bruno, Servetus, Copernicus, Gauss. All of them represented the future, yet all were overcome, in one way or another, during their own lives by the enthroned past. Copernicus was afraid to publish during his lifetime, lest he be burned as a heretic. Gauss only revealed his liberating discovery of non-Euclidean geometries after his death, for fear of the clamor of the Boeotians. It is therefore not surprising when the materialists persecute, by maligning, by conspiracy of silence, cutting off from access to publicity, or by driving to suicide, as in the case of Holschoffer, those who think in 20th century terms and specifically reject the methods and conclusions of 19th century materialism. The 20th century view of history has to make its way over the ruins of the linear scheme, which insisted on seeing history as a progression from an ancient through a medieval to a modern. I say ruins, for the scheme collapsed decades ago, but they are heavily defended ruins. Hidden in them are the materialists, the posthumous inhabitants of the 19th century the progress Philistines, the social ethicians, the superannuated devotees of critical philosophy, the ideologists of every description whatever. Common to them all is rationalism. They assume, as a tenet of faith, that history is reasonable, that they themselves are reasonable, and that therefore history has done, and will do, what they think it should. The origin of the three-stage view of history is found in St. Joachim of Flores, a Gothic religionist who put forward the three stages as a mystical progression. It was left for the increasing coarseness of intellect devoid of soul to make the progression a materialistic utilitarian one. For two centuries now, each generation has regarded itself as the peak of all the previous striving of the world. This shows that materialism is also a faith, a crude caricature of the precedent religion. It is supplanted now, not because it is wrong, for faith can never be injured by refutation, but because the spirit of the age is devoid of materialism. The linear scheme was more or less satisfactory to Western man as long as he knew nothing of history outside the Bible, classic authors, and Western chronicles. Even then, it would not have held up if the philosophy of history had not been a neglected field of endeavor. However, a little over a century ago began a spate of archaeological investigation including excavations and deciphering of original inscriptions in Egypt, Babylonia, Greece, Crete, China, and India. It continues today, and now includes also Mexico and Peru. The result of these investigations was to show the historically-minded Western civilization that it was by no means unique in its historical grandeur, but that it belonged to a group of high cultures, of similar structure, and of equal elaboration and splendor. The Western culture is the first to have had both the intense historical impetus as well as the geographic situation to develop a thorough archaeology, which includes now within its purview the whole historical world, just as Western politics at one time embraced the whole surface of the earth. The results of this profound archaeological science broke down the old-fashioned linear scheme of regarding history. It was utterly unable to fit in the new wealth of facts. Since there was some geographic even though no historical community between the Egyptian, Babylonian, classical, and Western cultures, it had been able to distort them somehow into a picture that could convince those who already believed. But with the opening up of the history of the cultures that were fulfilled in India, China, Arabia, Mexico, Peru, this view could no longer convince even believers. Furthermore, the materialistic spirit, which had posited the influence of preceding cultures on subsequent ones, Meanwhile died out, and the new psychological outlook on life recognized the primacy of the soul, the inner purity of the soul, and the superficiality of the process of borrowing of externalia. The new feeling about history was actually coeval with the tremendous outburst of archaeological activity which broke down the old linear scheme. The new outlook became a sole necessity of Western civilization at the same time that the history-seeking activity did even though it was to remain half-articulate until the First World War. This intense outburst of probing of the past was an expression of a super-personal feeling that the riddle of history was not touched with the old linear device, that it had to be unlocked 
that the totality of facts must be surveyed. As the new facts accumulated, the higher ranking historians took a wider view, but not until the latter part of the 19th century did any historian or philosopher actually treat cultures as separate organisms with parallel existence, independence, and spiritual equality. The idea of cultural history itself was a forerunner of this view and was a prerequisite to the development of the 20th century outlook on history. The rejection of the idea that history was merely the record of reigns and battles, treaties and dates, marked an epoch. The feeling spread that universal history was wanted. The combination of the history of politics, law, religion, manners, society, commerce, art, philosophy, warfare, erotic, literature, into one great synthesis. Schiller was one of the first to articulate this general need, although both Voltaire and Winckelmann had written specific histories along these lines. Hegel, on a spiritual basis, and Compton Buckle, materialistically, developed further the idea of total history, i.e. cultural history. Burkhardt not only produced a quite perfect example of a cultural history in his Italian Renaissance book, but developed a philosophy of history writing pointing toward the 20th century outlook. Taine, Lamprecht, Basig, Nietzsche, Mary, all are milestones in the development away from the linear view of history. In their times, only Nietzsche, and to a lesser extent Burkhardt and Bachhofen, understood the 20th century idea of the unity of a culture. But two generations later, the idea of the unity of a high culture is general in the highest spiritual stratum of Europe, and has become a prerequisite to both historical and political thinking. What was this linear view of history? It was either a mere arbitrary breaking up of historical materials for handling and reference without any claim to philosophical significance, or else it was an attempt at a philosophy of history. Its pretensions to the latter could not very well hold up in view of the fact that for generations the starting point of the modern age has been shifted around from century to century with complete freedom. Each writer has formulated the significance and dates of the three stages differently, and the various formulations exclude one another. But if they are not the same view, why the same terminology? Thus, it was no philosophy of history, but a mere set of three names, which were retained because of a sort of magic which was supposed to inhere in them. Nor was it a satisfactory method of breaking up the historical facts for reference purposes, since it left no place for China and India, and since it treated the Babylonian and Egyptian, in every way the historical equals of the classical and our own, as though they were mere episodes, together constituting a prelude to the classical. For this grotesque history outlook, a millennium in Egypt was a footnote, while ten years in our own century were a volume. Chapter 5, Section 2 The basis of the linear view was cultural egocentricity, or, in other words, the unconscious assumption that the Western culture was the focus of the whole meaning of all human history, that previous cultures had importance only insofar as they contributed something to us, but that in themselves they had no importance whatever. This is why the cultures which lived in areas remote from Western Europe are hardly even mentioned. These famous contributions, what was meant was a few technical devices from the Egyptian and Babylonian cultures, and the cultural remains generally of the classical. The Arabian, again, was almost totally ignored, for geographic reasons. And yet Western architecture, religion, philosophy, science, music, lyric, manners, erotic, politics, finance, economics, all are totally independent of the corresponding classical forms. It is the archaeological cast of the Western soul, its intensely historical nature, that prompts it to reverence what mere geography might indicate is a spiritual ancestor. And yet, who believes, or ever did actually believe, that the Rome of Hildebrand, of Alexander VI, of Charles V, or of Mussolini, had any continuity whatever with the Rome of Flaminius, Sulla, Caesar. This whole classicistic yearning of the West, with its two high points in the Italian Renaissance, and above all, in Winckelmann's movement, was actually nothing but a literary romantic pose. If we had known less of Rome and more of Mecca, Napoleon's title might have been Caliph instead of First Consul but nothing would have inwardly altered. The endowing of words and names with magic significance is quite necessary and legitimate in religion, philosophy, science, and criticism, but is out of place in an outlook on history. Even in the Italian Renaissance, Francesco Pico, 
rode against the mania for the classical. Who will be afraid to confront Plato with Augustine, or Aristotle with Thomas, Halbert, and Scotus? Savonarola's movement also had cultural as well as religious significance. Into the bonfires went the classical works. The whole classicist tendency of the Italian Renaissance has been too heavily drawn. It was literary, academic, the possession of a few small circles, and those not the leading ones in thought or action. And yet this movement has been put forward as the link between two cultures that have nothing in common in order to create a picture of history as a straight line instead of as the spiritually parallel, pure, independent development of high cultures. To the religious outlook, with its branches, philosophy, and criticism, progress, philistinism, and social ethics, facts figure only as proof and lack any other interest. To the historical outlook, facts are the material sought after, and even doctrines, dogmas, and truths are treated as simply facts. Previous Western ages were thus satisfied by the linear scheme, despite its complete independence of the facts of history. To the 20th century, however, with its center of gravity in politics, History is not a mere instrument of proving or illustrating any dogma or socio-ethical progress theory, but the source of our effective world outlook. And so, in implicit obedience to the spirit of the age, the leading minds of the 20th century reject the old-fashioned, anti-factual linear theory of history. In its place, the spirit of the age has shown the actual structure of human history, the history of eight high cultures, each an organism with its own individuality and destiny. The older type of philosophy of history forced the facts to prove some religious, ethical, or critical theory. The 20th century outlook takes its philosophy of history from the facts. The 20th century outlook is nonetheless subjective because it starts from facts. It is merely obeying the inner imperative of its own historical soul and seeing its history picture thus. Our view is nonetheless peculiarly ours because it gives priority to facts. Other types of men outside the Western culture, or beneath it, will never be able to understand it any more than they can understand higher Western mathematics, Western technics, physics or chemistry, Gothic architecture, or the art of the fugue. This picture of history, absolutely compulsory as it is for the leading men of thought or action in the Western civilization, is no compulsion for the masses that throng in the streets of the Western capitals. Historical relativity is, like physical relativity, the possession of a few leading minds. History is not experienced nor made in the streets, but on the heights. The number of men in the Western civilization who were aware of the actual meaning of the Second World War is countable in thousands. Western philosophy, from the days of Anselm, has always been esoteric. No less so is the 20th century outlook, and correspondingly small is the number of those for whom it is a sole necessity. But the number for whom the decisions of these few will be decisive is not numbered in hundreds, but in hundreds of millions. To the 20th century, the regarding of all previous human happenings as merely introductory to, and preparatory to, our own Western history is simply immense naivety. Evolutions that require just as long as our millennium of Western history are contracted into mere casual events. The men in these other cultures are treated as though they were children, dimly trying to attain to one or another of our specifically Western ideas. But in each of these previous cultures, the stage was reached and passed that we attained to in the 19th and 20th centuries. Free science, social ethics, democracy, materialism, atheism, rationalism, class war, money, nationalism, annihilation wars, highly artificial living conditions, megapolitan sophistication, social disintegration, divorce, degeneration of the old arts into mere formlessness. They exhibited all these familiar symptoms. The vast amount of historical knowledge of which the 20th century must take account, knowledge unearthed by the historical age which succeeded to the age of criticism, can tolerate no arbitrary forcing of the facts of history into a preconceived scheme with three magical stages, which must remain three even though no one can agree where one begins and the other leaves off and of which the third stage has been prolonged indefinitely since Professor Horn of Leyden announced in 1667 his discovery of the Middle Ages. The first formulation of the 20th century outlook on history only came with the First World War. Previously, only Brasig had definitely broken with the linear scheme, but his earlier work covered only a part of human history. 
It was left to Spengler, the philosopher of the age, to set forth the full outline of the structure of history. He himself was the first to recognize the superpersonal nature of his work when he said that an historically essential idea is only in a limited sense the property of him to whose lot it falls to parent it. It was for him to articulate that at which everyone was groping. The view of others was limited by one or another specialist horizon, and their projects were consequently incomplete, one-sided, top-heavy. Like all products of genius, Spengler's work seems perfectly obvious to those who come afterwards, and again, it was always directed to those to come, and not to contemporaries. Genius is always directed towards the future. This is in its nature, and this is the explanation of the usual fate of all works of genius, political and economic, as well as artistic and philosophical, that they are understood in their grandeur and simplicity only by the afterworld of their creators.